So, Todd, I'm not talking to you today. <laughs> That'll make for a really short show, man. <laughs> Why aren't you talking to me? Did I, did I take you off or something? Because you made a post on my Facebook page about yeah. a year and a half ago that I just can't seem to get over. Really? You're still hanging on to that? I, 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 thought, I, I thought we put that behind us. Well, no. No, I just I can't get over it. Every time I look at it, every time I every time I stumble upon it, I just I, I, what was he thinking? So I, I'm I'm not talking to you anymore. You need you need to put those online memories in the past, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do. You know, it's funny that you say that. Talk about a segue. <laughs> so we were referring to a to a story in the Washington Post this week. I I don't know if you saw this or not, Todd, but um, I did yes. You know, in in the in the in the holiday spirit, with us continuing to to have family events and all that kind of stuff, um, saw a, saw an article about a re research done in the the virtue of forgetting in the digital age, and how important it is that we that we naturally forget things, but how how rare that's becoming because of things like Facebook and being able to archive every single message you ever get in Gmail and all that kind of stuff, how old arguments are being rehashed and keep coming up more and more and more and people just not being able to get, get over it. So that is kind of interesting. I don't, I don't know. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. In some ways I see what they're saying. They're, they're essentially saying that um, our, our brains function, that that's a good part of our brain is that as the time tends to kill all those wounds, but if, if you have a written documentation of all those things and you come upon that, that it's going to reignite the feelings. I do think that's true. Um, you know, I, when I read this article, I thought uh, there's there's um, uh, two files that I have in my file folder mm -hmm. of, of uh, past instances and circumstances. Uh, one at a, at, a, at a church that I was on staff at, that uh, documentation from, from some things that went on there, that uh, uh, very seldom do I ever uh, go through those files, but every once in a while I'll be going through looking for a file, and I'll see that, and I don't know why, but I pull it up, I open it up, and it's like you're reliving it as yeah. soon as you do it. Uh, and and it's something I hadn't thought about for you know two years, but uh, so I understand that. I think two things. I think we've always done this. You know, people keep diaries. People have kept diaries for years. Uh, pictures can do this, um, although we take a lot more pictures now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we've always done this to a certain degree, but the other thing is I don't go through normally unless it's like when I go through my file folder and I come upon something. I don't normally go back and, and try to search um, things like that. Yeah. So I don't come upon those old posts. They're there, uh, you know. Uh, particularly as a blogger, all of my blog posts and when I've been upset and and all those things are there. But I don't normally just kind of come upon those things. So they. That's what they're saying, but I don't think it really bothers me. Doesn't bother, doesn't bother you. I mean, it only bothers you if whatever I said a year and a half ago, you're still ticked off. Yeah, I forgot it already, actually. <laughs> I'm not sure what I put on your Facebook page, but I'm sure it was something mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just knowing me. Oh, well. Yeah. Somebody didn't sue me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. Like, Speak, speaking like, uh, of suing and, and speaking of suing, <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna head into the the uh, pop ministry uh, section of our show where uh, Todd brings up all of the uh, famous people in Christianity and, and inquiring minds want to know Todd. <laughs> yeah. Well, there there actually was uh, a little bit of news this year with uh, this year this week um, with a couple of kind of high profile. Uh, people in Christianity. First of all, Robert Schuller, we mentioned here, it was uh, him and his wife and some family members were suing uh, the former, former. Well, I guess it's still the Crystal Christ, Crystal Cathedral Ministries. I had I had too much alcohol this morning. I, I can't even get my words out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Schuller's were, were suing uh, Crystal Cathedral Ministries. I don't usually drink until eleven, but I don't know. It's Friday. Um, but uh, the verdict came back now. The, I put the headline on my blog. The Schulers lost big time in court, but they still walked away with $615,000. Uh, $625. Um, but they were, they were asking for over $5 million. Uh, the judge gave Robert Schuler, I think, the $600,000. Uh, gave, uh, I think, the daughter, 
and the son-in-law a little bit of money. Arvella, uh, Robert's wife, got got the big goose egg. She got nothing. They said she was not believable or something like that in court. Not not found to be real credible. Um, so that's kind of the big news there. Sad story all around. Um, is this going to be done? You know, I'm hoping. I'm hoping that this is done. Although they're going to be in the news because I think in April, is it April when the when they officially the church officially moves out of the Crystal Cathedral building and yeah. and uh, and the Catholic uh, Diocese of Orange moves in. So so you'll still hear a little bit about that. And from what I read about the story, there's still fourteen million dollars. Something like that in uh, disputes that the creditors are still trying to get their hands on, wow. and uh, a lot of this uh, five million dollars, I think, can still be contested over there. So I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's not done. It's sad, sad all around. Uh, another sad thing I saw this week. Um, interesting thing. You know, we, we could make a show on Pat Robertson. <laughs> we really could. Uh, Pat Robertson, I've got a, a, a link on my blog that, um, that with a little video clip, we'll have it on the show notes. But Pat Robertson came out this past week and said that he admits that he totally, totally botched uh, God's voice on the election. Um, and, and I remember watching, um, it was kind of a kind of an interesting clip at the first of the year. You know, Pat always does his uh, predictions for the year. For 2012, he came out and he said, now God told me who... Who won? The, who's going to win the election? But he told me not to tell you, which I thought ah, that's pretty sneaky of God. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, to, to let Pat Robertson. Know. But if, and I don't know that Pat Robertson ever really told officially what he said God told him. But he came out this past week and said, whatever I thought God told me, it was wrong, and and I totally missed God's voice here, and it happens. Well, this this might floor you, Todd. Um, okay. Because I, I don't normally say anything super enthusiastically positive about about our our, our buddy Pat, but I, I will give him credit for coming out and actually saying this. Because I mean, he, he had the ability to say, "Yeah, I knew it was a problem all the time." God told me, you know. Yeah. But I, I give him credit for having the integrity to come out and say, "Yeah, I was wrong," even though I didn't tell you and I didn't have to. You know, I was wrong. So I, you know, I give him credit for that, you know, in a sort of way. Have you? Let me ask you a personal question. Have you ever? And I don't mean I mean this very seriously. Have yeah. you ever heard the voice of God? <sighs> once that to I, where you were absolutely positively oh, yeah. sure that it was the voice of yeah. God speaking once. to man. Right? Once, 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 did it prove out to be true? Yeah, I yeah. was. I was sitting. I was sitting in my in my room. I was a cadet at the Air Force Academy. I was sitting in my room serving confinements, which is another story for another time. <laughs> and um, <laughs> that was yeah. that was the day that I was called to ministry. Really, and it was it was just one of those one of those times when you, you hear in that way, and you know how do you how do you put words to this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. But you just and it was so totally outside of the realm of anything that I would have thought anyhow. Mm -hmm. Um, that you know, that was that was the one time. You know, and it's never happened since. Not in that way. <laughs> not in that way. Yeah. Not, not see, that clear. See, I, I felt at, at particularly turning points in my life that I felt that I that I have a peace with God mm -hmm. that God gives me. You know, but I've never heard I've never heard that audible, the audible voice that I have some friends that have heard. Yeah, and other people that I've heard, and and quite honestly, it would. Uh, I've got two friends that I'm thinking right now. One that is just you know he said the only time it's ever happened to me, and it's it's a it's a it's a story that make your you know shivers run up your spine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I've got another one that uh, that kind of like Pat here that kind of came out and said this is what God told me, and yet it, it, it later proved that that just wasn't. Yeah, it didn't match up. Um, so I don't know. And what Pat says is, you know, you think you think you're confident on these things, but you you just never know. Mm -hmm. um, which makes me real skeptical. Is not a good word, but I think if I did hear, I'd be really careful about. I had I had a woman come up to me one time after church and said, "Todd, 
God told me that you were supposed to have me over for, for lunch today. Ooh. And this, this lady was a little weird. I said, I said, I said, well, Pack, I said, he hasn't told me that yet, so as soon as he tells me, I'll give you a call. This, this um, wasn't... This, yeah, this. So, yeah, this is just... I, I don't know where that came from, but... Uh, but I'm always, I'm always really not that I'm skeptical that God does speak like that. I think He does. Um, and I, like I said, I've, I felt that He's over, over the years. I, I feel very confident in the direction that He's given, and it takes a lot of prayer and, mm -hmm. and all kinds of things to get there. But, but I've seen too many, too many people say God told me this. Well, and, you know, for for me, part of it is like, what, what's it? So what's He talking about? You know. And do we do we really? And this this will get us all sorts of hate mail. But I mean, do we really think that he is gonna tell Pat Robertson that this is? You know, I mean, is there a purpose for that? It, you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, is he really yeah. saying this is this is who's who's gonna win the election? Is that is that something that he is really gonna gonna speak to? And yeah, I'm not saying one way or the other, but it's like. Okay. How about how about the the lunch thing? You know, I mean, is he really going to speak to that? I mean, in some cases, I'm sure he does. You know, he told Paul, "This is what you're going to do," and he told him. Um, so, I mean, that's there. You go quote the Bible again, man. Oh, dang it! <laughs> <laughs> Don't violate that rule here again. Yeah. <laughs> now, now we'll get the hate mail. That was totally. What, what the watchdog site's going to say? We're yes. quoting the Bible. <laughs> Totally a joke for my watchdoggy friends. Uh, actually, I have another Pat, Pat Robertson story that I, I will save for next week. Oh, good. Uh, but, I, Cliff, I just found this thing about uh, Pat. It's going to infuriate all of the creationists. Let me just say that. Oh, I saw that. Did you see that? Well, let's, let's save that for next week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Too concerned like said, for Pat Robertson. <laughs> <laughs> So, Quick, anyway, from, change the subject. Yes. Oh, let's go to John MacArthur. Oh, yes. Let's, can we speak about uh, John MacArthur? I, you know, I, I like John MacArthur. I have he nothing against John, John MacArthur. Yes, we, John, we know you're watching. Uh, I'm actually trying to find my uh, my John MacArthur post here. Hang on here a second while I hold it. Um, uh, I have no problem with, with uh, John MacArthur. I think he's a... I think he's a good guy, but I, I posted something. And this was uh, a few months back. It was this year, but he posted this on his uh, Grace to You video blog talking about multi-sites uh, and multi-site ministry. And he's just really, really, I, I, I know multi-site is not as con controversial as it was, you know, yeah. five years ago or something. And, of course, in full disclosure, I work with Leadership Network, and we've done tons of stuff with multi-sites over the year. But uh, John MacArthur here uh he said that uh, his his idea of multi-site comes across to him as absolutely, uh, completely artificial. It's not real. It's not reality. Uh, he talks about um, uh, and the video clip's really interesting because he kind of goes into how how horrible it is that all these pastors are speaking from these screens. And it's all personality driven. And he said, "Now I know that we have a TV and a radio ministry that's really <laughs> large, but that that is uh, totally something that's different." It's, in his words, it's supplemental. Okay, it's not the church; it's supplemental. And and I understand. Uh, I mean, I understand what he's saying. He's saying there's no intimacy, there's no connection, there's no friendship, there's no vulnerability or exposure, and that's essential to be a pastor. But John MacArthur is in a church of eight thousand people. Yeah. Uh, you know, so uh, I doubt that he's able to pastor on a one-to-one -one level. Uh, if that's what he's talking about, as far as intimacy and connection with your people as a pastor. John MacArthur can't do that at a church of 8,000. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think the missing piece that John misses here, of course, I, 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 not all, multi, all multi-sites are great, but uh, the campus pastors that are a part of the multi-site uh, movement, they're not the preaching pastors, but they're still doing the work and role of the pastor Absolutely. And, and caring for the for the people spiritually and, and all of that. So uh, it's an interesting clip. Go watch it and see what you think again. No ill against John MacArthur. I think John MacArthur's a, a a great guy. He's not necessarily in my in my uh, uh, list for for um, day to day stuff, but um, 
Uh, he was he was big in in the circles that I grew up in, mm -hmm. and still continues to be to be uh, to be really really big. So that's that's my uh, that's my spiel on uh, on John MacArthur. Um, and we're going to go right from John MacArthur to one of his John's favorite people, who is Rick Warren. Uh, <laughs> Have I mentioned before on the show that I am so glad that I am not Rick Warren? Have I, have I mentioned that? Why? Why is that, Todd? I, I love I love Rick, and and it's not like we're best best buddies, but I, I know Rick, and he's a he's a yeah yeah, yeah yeah we know you're watching, Rick. Um, but uh, Rick's a good guy, man. I've never seen a guy that that loves um, people and love. The church as much as as Rick Warren does, but the reason I wouldn't want to be Rick is because he's so high profile that anything the guy Sting does gets written up. Oh, yeah. uh, you know his. Uh, uh, this is a great case in point. Rick Warren uh, tweeted, uh, uh, I think it was last week, early last week, that game style. You know the doom, 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 that that thing. No, don't. Can you do that again, do that. please? No, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, the Gangnam Style by by the artist Psy has been his ringtone since July 20th, and I thought it was funny. I mean, I yeah. tweeted him back and said, "Rick, I'm, I'm totally surprised. I thought you'd be either a Nicki Minaj or a, a Katy <laughs> Perry type person, but um, but I never imagined Gangnam Style." Uh, but uh, I, and I think we've got the the link in the uh, in the show notes. But uh, oh, just the I've seen a couple of these posts of people that are just outraged that America's pastor, yeah, would, and this is what you get. This is what you get, people. When when the church goes, you know, and tries to adopt the culture, you get America's pastor that's got Gangnam Style as his ringtone, and the church has no potency. And it's like, oh my goodness. You know, I I, I hear what you're saying about not wanting to be wrecked. Because I mean, if the, the dude if the dude belches or passes gas. In, in, in public, it's going to be another reason, you know, oh, he's going flaming Pentecostal or something like that, you know? <laughs> it's just, you can't win. You can't win. But here's here's what I, here's my thoughts on it. I just actually had a conversation about Rick Warren um, earlier this week with somebody who was, who was asking about him. And this is, this is what I know. I have, over the years, I have become more and more impressed with the man. I really have. He is... Mm -hmm. In my mind, and, and Rick, and like we said, we know you're watching. You know, he is he is aged like a fine grape juice. You know, this is, he is he comes out of that background, right? Like a fine grape juice, yes. Fine, fine grape juice. Yeah. Yes. The, people will get that. People will get that in about five minutes. It'll. <laughs> <laughs> but he he really he really I I've, I've been very impressed with him. And one of the things I think that really to to me is I, I'll go down to exponential. I think you go down to exponential as well. Yep. Yep. You know, church planner conference, and you got all these people kind of running around and all the speakers from all over the place, you know, big churches and stuff. And, you know, you'll see some of those guys around, but what what never has what just always incredibly impressed me is, you know, you can walk around the campus, and there's Rick Warren sitting down with some church planner from, you know, Podunk, Wisconsin, you know, population three people. Mm -hmm. You know, just hanging out with a church planner, hearing a story and talking to him. I mean, who does that? Yeah. You know, and that's just, that is, that's that's impressed me a, a great deal. And so, you know what? If he has Gangnam Style as his ringtone, man, maybe, maybe I need to consider changing my ringtone. <laughs> Do you think anybody would write a blog post about me changing my ringtone? Yeah, you you drank the wine juice, I mean the grape juice there, grape juice. man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's good. And, and speaking of Rick, he was he was kind of making the rounds this week. On I thought it was interesting. He made the rounds at least on CBS this morning, and he was on Piers Morgan on CNN, uh, actually to promote um, I think the tenth anniversary of Purpose Driven Life that was yes. re released and, uh, and updated somewhat. But I thought it was interesting. On both of those interviews, he got uh, he got kind of backed up against the wall or in a corner a little bit on the whole gay marriage thing. On both of those, which I thought was interesting, since he wasn't really there to talk about gay marriage. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, that's any time, any time. That's you, you got the target on you. you know, mm -hmm. You're, you're going to get the business for that. But I was, I the the Pierce um, Pierce Morgan thing. What really impressed me about that is how that conversation started. Did you did you hear that? 
But, no, I didn't hear how it started. He says, you have, he, Pierce says, you clearly have no problem with gay people. That's, that's the line from the man. You know, and how cool is that? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, mean, I mean, seriously, the, the, the church doesn't necessarily have that rap. You know, we, we've got a problem. We've got a big, you know, beef with that. But no, mm -hmm. that's where they start out with Rick, which I thought was, was kind of cool. And, of course, you know, he can't win that one either way. You know, there's going to be people sniping at him, you know, either way because he's not a cultural warrior or because, you know, of his views. But I, I, I watched that stuff. I was pretty impressed. You know, I was impressed with how he, how he handled it. I've, I've watched Piers Morgan, and he's. Uh, I, I, I watched a similar interview with Piers and, and Joel Osteen mm -hmm. uh, that turned out much differently, I think, than, yeah. than this. And Joel Osteen's fine. I, I think Joel Osteen is probably the nicest guy on the face of the earth. Of course. And, uh, and, and putting that, putting him up against Piers Morgan, he's going to get pummeled. <laughs> Sorry, Joel. Uh, we know you're watching. Uh, but. Uh, but no, I thought it was good because this is uh, the few times that I've watched Piers Morgan. This is one of his big things: mm -hmm. is the whole gay marriage thing. And and in, in his mind, why logically would you not allow people who are in love to enjoy the same freedom that you do? So what? Yeah, what? From what you're saying, what I am really impressed is that even in Piers Morgan, who has this kind of uh, kind of assaultive personality I've seen on a couple of interviews that he's done on this. Even he looks at Rick Warren and says, okay, well, clearly you have no problem with gay people, but help me understand how you don't have a problem with gay people, but you still feel this way. And I think, boy, I, I wish, I'm with you, I wish that Christianity as a whole had at least that, where, where reasonable people can sit down and say, okay, we understand that um, you don't understand this, but you don't have a problem with gay people. It's, you know what I mean? Yeah, and what, what was really cool about that, and you, you touched on this, is, is Rick stopped in the middle of it and said, you know, I really appreciate the way that you're going at this. Mm -hmm. you know, and talking about how you know, tolerance has kind of shifted its meaning from mm -hmm. being okay with people, even though we might have different views, to, oh, we have to say that everything's okay. You know, he, he went there, but he was... You know, it, it, he was very civil about it, and people that was that was really cool to watch because it wasn't the the typical interview of you know people just taking pot shots at each other and mm -hmm. you know yeah, to yeah. no it sure. was it was very because uh, yeah like I said from what the times I've seen Piers is that uh, if, if most of his interviews are not that congenial yeah uh, when particularly when he's talking with somebody that's against gay marriage they're not congenial at all actually yeah. Um, so, so good job, Rick. But, and there was one point in the interview, I think, too, where where uh, Piers asked him a question, and Rick kind of paused, and it wasn't. You could tell it wasn't a. Uh, oh, you stumped me. It was a. I'm really trying to think of the best words to use to answer your question in a in a really good. You could tell the wheels were turning, and he gave a very good answer. Yeah. Um, so. I think I think we all could learn from that. You know. One of, yeah. one of the things when I was in when I was in school that they talked about when, when, when I guess it was a preaching class was you know to embrace the power of silence and, and be okay with the fact that there's there's a little bit of dead air if you need to either remember what you're saying if you need to think about what you're what you're about to say and I don't I don't think we do a good job of, of that as you know as a society as a whole I mean we're so quick to put you know word in get a word in edgewise and you know you know, shoot before we aim with, with our tongue. And, I mean, this podcast is a great example of that. We just, you know, babble on, babble on without stopping to think about what we're saying from time to time, you know? But um, I, I think I, I think we could learn a great deal just just from watching him in that interview, how he interacted with it. So, good, good job, Rick. I think you're right. Way to embrace the silence, Todd. I'm pretty proud of you. It was very difficult. It was very difficult. <laughs> it's life, I tried. That's life change on the filter. It, it made you a little nervous, didn't it? <laughs> well, I was thinking, okay, he's either embracing the silence or he froze up again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> oh, my. What else you got this week, man? That's, um, that's good stuff. Yeah, uh, last last week we had a football story, so I felt like we needed to do another football story this week. Um, 
for for Jets fans, um, they they know that there's there's a local fan known as Fireman Ed, and he's a dude that shows up in a Jets jersey and a Jets fire fireman helmet, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm convinced when the Jets are doing well, he's probably the most par- powerful man in all of New York because he will in the middle in the middle of of the game, the camera will focus on him and he'll get up. And he'll silence the entire stadium. And everybody will be quiet. And then all of a sudden he leads out the J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 cheer. And the whole stadium gets in. It's, it's pretty impressive. I, I don't like the Jets, but it's pretty impressive. So Yeah, I've, I've, I saw a picture of him on the story you sent this morning, but uh, I'm, I'm not a Jets fan. I've never heard of him. But this was, this was an interesting story. So he's, he's just kind of... He, he, he he's retired. retiring. He he retired. Um, he he, re, he retired earlier this week, and he said, "You know, it's not because the Jets are doing awful, even though they are." And I thought the I thought the quote that he said is um, was was pretty humorous for those of you that that know football. He says, "Listen, I went through the Rich Cotite era. They were, we were four twenty eight in that era. Any Jets fan knows that this isn't the worst of times. It isn't even close. It's been about the nastiness." And he goes on to talk about how you know fans, whether they're Jets fans or not, are just they're getting nasty with him, and they're taking out all their frustrations on him for the season and everything that's going on. And he's just he just came to the point where he said, you know, I just I'm I'm done with this. I, so how how long has he done this? Oh shoot, he's he's done it for years. Um, and were I properly prepared, I would have. I would have. Yeah, that's, that's okay. Like probably twenty years or so. Anyway, easily. Huh? easily. Yeah. Easily. So guy, he's he's seeing he's seeing. I'm wondering if that if there's. Uh, I wonder. I'm wondering what he's seeing there. Is that just the way that kind of the culture is right now? Is it? Uh, it's well, the the state the nation's in, or what do you think? That's that's what he's saying. He's saying it's the culture. He's saying everybody's just getting nasty, and, and there's not the sense of of congeniality maybe that's the word that I'm, that I'm looking for that you know it's it's now it's just people are just getting up in his face and you know, he's not paid by the team he's a season ticket holder and this is just something that he's always done and he basically said he's tired of people getting up in his face and he doesn't want to take a swing at somebody because once he does that then it's all over and I just you know is this, is this guy also pastor no he's not he's a fireman Go figure. <laughs> yeah, that's but, like the bad. but it's funny. It's funny that you that you say that because that's that's kind of why I put it up there. I mean, this is. Yeah. Tell me where this doesn't happen in church. You know, there's the pastor piece to it, but I also think that there's a volunteer piece in this. You know, mm-hmm. you know, our our front frontline volunteers. You know, we need to be caring well for them. You know, and and maybe not protect them from some of this, but at least give them give them the support that they need to be able to deal with some of these some of the times when people get up in their face and all that kind of stuff. I just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I read this story and I started thinking, you know, this this is like this is the story of a key volunteer in a ministry, a key leader that's been there for years that just gets to the point where you know what I'm I'm done, mm-hmm. I'm just frustrated. I'll, I'll I'll continue to come to the church, but you know I'm not doing the leadership thing anymore. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think it's true also of of paid pastors. Oh yeah, I do uh, it, it runs all all the way across the board. Um, but uh, now, uh, are people nastier now in the church than they were ten years ago? I I don't know. I don't know if uh, people people have always been nasty. Mm-hmm. Um, where I'm seeing it different now with the internet is that people take that it used to be uh, it had to be people would fire off a letter. Mm-hmm. Um, or they would uh, pick up the phone and do a little gossip call, um, uh, but now it's uh, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's blogs, websites uh, devoted towards running somebody out of town. It's it's websites that uh, release um, uh, email correspondence yeah. to back up their point. It's it's it, 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 from that regard. In the last five years, it's been. Uh, Particularly nasty and particularly public. Um, I don't know if it's nastier, but it's much more public. 
Well, it's and it's and I think this goes back to the whole the whole thing that we started with. I mean, it's it's harder to forget now. Yeah. I mean, it's it's harder to let things go when you have forty seven people, you know, commenting on your Facebook page telling you about how you know, you know, yeah. talking about who you descended from, you yeah. know, yeah. And, and that kind of stuff. I just it's it, it may not be nastier, but man, it's more out there and it's far more public and harder to forget. Yeah. Yeah. It is. But you know, thankfully we're entering into the Christmas season. Oh yeah. Uh, good goodwill toward men, you know, we put all of that stuff behind us and Yeah. And, and, and for, for fortunate, fortunately the uh, the fight shift then. And instead of instead of, you know, Smack talking about leadership styles and who should be in charge of the church. We just we just talk about the types of trees that we're going to display. So I, I saw that uh, I saw that you you found a couple of uh, yes. people that are not getting along so well this Christmas yes. season. Of course not. As you know, normal. I, it, it's it's that time of year again. It's should we have a holiday tree? Should we have a Christmas tree? And you know, I, I don't have much to say about this outside of the fact that. Yeah, I just I've always wanted to keep a running tally of, of of how many Christmas trees there are and how many holiday trees there are. And so this week I, I read that um Rhode Island, they're not having a Christmas tree. It's a holiday tree. Mm -hmm. so, you know, that's that's Rhode Island's stance. But but and this may be a surprise, the US Capitol, they've they have an official Christmas tree. So right now they still call it a Christmas. Yeah, they they still call it a Christmas tree. And it actually it came from somewhere in Colorado. And apparently they've got some dude dressed in a Santa Claus suit that rides with it from the farm, stops in a bunch of towns, people come out and... It's, a big deal. It's, like, it's like the Olympic torch on the Olympic Christmas tree. Yeah, exactly. So I, I wonder how much Santa gets paid for that game. But anyhow. Well, I, I want to go on the record as saying I think all trees in December should be called Christmas trees because, as we know, Christmas comes from the King, King James Version. Of course. You'll find the word Christmas there. Well, and, and here's and, uh, here's the thing. I mean, if if it was good enough for Jesus in the manger, I mean, it's 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 good enough for me. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm with you, Matt. And and um, you know, the the twinkling lights. Uh, you know, if they were if they were good enough for for Jesus' birth, they're they're good enough for my living room. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, we better move on because we're going to get struck by lightning or something here. <laughs> the internet connection. I will. I will. Yeah. <laughs> so no, I I don't really have a I don't have a dog in that fight either. Do I think it's it's a cultural thing, and uh, I'm going to call it Christmas tree. Yeah, it's you know why why do we have to fight about this stuff every year? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the big reason is Fox News because Fox News brings it up every year. It drives like Fox News, but but they do they drive the story every year. Oh, yeah. they, they find the places that are kicking out the nativities and calling out holiday trees and and run the Fox News alert on it and and <laughs> I'm tired. It's the, it's the end of the world. It's not even <laughs> what December twenty first yet. So. Exactly, exactly. If only people would just give back more yeah. rather than. Yeah, take all the time. Yeah, we we need to get 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 beyond that. Last last week we talked about your your dreadful Black Friday experience. It was horrible. It was horrible. Yeah, I'm still still in therapy for that. But um, I don't I don't know if you saw this, but Rick Rick McKinley um, from Imago Day out in Portland, he he had a piece on CNN just talking about Giving Tuesday. Did you hear about Giving Tuesday? You know, I did, and I was disinterested. Really? I'm just being totally honest out there. Why is that? You, you know what? I think it's great. And I think what uh, uh, what they're doing with uh, uh, Advent, is it Advent Conspiracy? Is that what yeah. it's called? Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely awesome. Absolutely awesome. No, the only problem I have with, with giving, giving Tuesday. Giving Tuesday. Is that there are too many days. There, there are too many days and too many groups trying to put out too many days. It's like, uh, so you've got Black Friday, um, you've got Cyber Monday, you've got um, Giving Tuesday, you have um, Bless Bless Friday. Have you heard of Bless Friday? No, no. It's it's also uh, kind of a church related deal that you know after you do all of your black. Black Friday stuff. You go out and you bless people with, 
with things. But there's too many days for me, and there's Small Business Saturday. Yeah. Uh, so too many days for me to keep track of. But. Somebody, somebody was trying to make it Youth Pastor Sunday because the Sunday <laughs> after Thanksgiving is apparently the only day that the Youth Pastor gets to preach. <laughs> That's not bad. So I, I think I have a solution for this. Yeah? I think we just cancel Thanksgiving. That's one less day than we can have Giving Tuesday. We'd lose our day off, though. Oh, true. True. <laughs> Never mind. So, so I'm against that. It's just... <laughs> But no, I, I think I think I think Rick's point, Rick McKinley's point, was that uh, if he was going to choose between Black Friday and um, Giving Tuesday, that Giving Tuesday was a much better representation of the Christmas story and what we should be doing. And yeah, yeah, absolutely, no, no, um, no fault there. Any yeah. other thoughts on that one? Well, every every year there seems to be more and more pushback to this whole Black Friday thing. Even though they keep expanding the hours and the sales, mm -hmm. it's kind of kind of surreal to me. I don't know if you saw the, the meme on Facebook about um, you know only in America do we do we have a day to celebrate all the things we want after being thankful for all the things that we have. <laughs> yeah, just saying, you know. So I I, I appreciated I appreciated his piece and and just kind of saying that you know. Mm -hmm. oh, really, is this is this really the best story we can tell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I agree. I agree. It makes the things stories like that do make me think. I just wish there was a better. I just get I get weary of all of the, all of the hype around the different days, and I can't keep them straight when there's five different yeah. theme days in, in five days. I need what? Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Well, let's close with a couple of thought pieces here, quick. Okay. I, I love I love pieces that. That just kind of make me think. Um, there was one uh, by uh, I think it were church leaders by Brian Ormy where he talks about um, wives' tales of church growth, and I just kind of took one and, and popped it on my blog. But this is one that I've maybe I grew up with, so maybe it's more of a of a cultural thing that I grew up with. But uh, the first myth he says that if your church isn't growing, something's wrong. Um, and I, I admit that I push back on that a little bit because uh, I've always felt that if your church is healthy, you're going to be growing. And that doesn't always mean numbers-wise, but at least means disciple-wise or something. Right. And I realize when you say that that you don't want to – I don't think that all growing churches are healthy. Okay, That's the first thing that I want to say. Um, but at the same time, I think that most healthy churches should be growing. Uh, or shouldn't be stagnant. I realize people moving out all the time and changing churches and new people coming in and it might all kind of even out. But um, there's just something uh, in my mind that says it, if your church is healthy, uh, there's going to be some change and some lives changed and some right. additions to the family and that type of thing. And it's been a, a really good conversation over at my blog on it uh, as far as people kind of taking both sides of it. Um, what what? Let me say one more thing, and I really want to hear what you think about this. Most of the time, and I don't want this to sound horrible, but there's no other way to say it. I think most of the time, the people that say that that is totally wrong are from churches that aren't growing, mm -hmm. uh, and they kind of use it as an excuse of, um, and and they and and kind of a backhanded punch at the megachurch. Uh, you know that are stealing all the people or have all the resources that we don't have. Um, maybe that's unfair, but that's that's usually where I see the criticism of this whole idea coming. What do you think? Um, I, I, I I'm with you on on your last comment. Um, when it becomes an excuse, is that I think there's there's a significant issue. You know, oh, we're not. You know. So I, I agree with you in your last comment, but you know I, I stopped using the word growing in that a, a long time ago and started ch change it to movement. You know, there's mm -hmm. in healthy church. I like that. A healthy church has movement, and and the youth pastor and me, you know, in order to make it something that's kind of sticky with people, you know, movement is healthy for churches and bows. So that's. <laughs> Kind of, kind of, you know, something I've gone with for a while. Because I mean, if if a church is declining in attendance, 
you know, sometimes that's a good thing. You know, there's there's some churches where that needs to happen before growth numerically starts, and and you kind of need to. What was the um, out or it, it basically it's the multi or it's the addition by subtraction type of type of a deal in some cases. I mean, there's there's churches where that's a very healthy thing and that needs to happen. Yeah, I've, I've heard a pastor say uh, or uh, that uh, his church was a few funerals away from revival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and I mean, we we saw it when we were in Baltimore. There was there was a family that needed to go, mm -hmm. and once they did, I mean, it was it's it's it sounds awful because you know the church we're supposed to be letting everybody in, we're supposed to be caring for everybody, and all that kind of stuff. But I mean, there's just there's some times when you're just not equipped to be able to care for for a certain family and they would be better served by another church and they need to go before the church can grow and get it to a point where it can, can care for that. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think movement is, is a big deal, you know, and it's our people being discipled, our people yeah. being, um, having their lives change, our people, you know, mm -hmm. turning their back on addictions that they've been walking with for years and years and families mm -hmm. being restored, you know. Yeah, it really comes down to life change, don't you think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Whether it's relationship with Christ or, or the addictions piece or uh, just discipleship, uh, people accepting Jesus. Um, uh, I really like what you said. I, I'm going to throw. I'm going to change my vocabulary as far as growth because growth, I think, is very nebulous. Yeah, you can, you can speak numerical growth. You can speak spiritual growth. But I like. I like your. Your analysis of, of there, there needs to be movement in a healthy church. There'll be movement, and maybe everybody would agree with that. Maybe you just solved one of, one of the churches. This is this has been a life changing day for Todd Rose. Not only is he becoming more comfortable with silence, but now he's changing his vocabulary. Man, yes, we should probably do the altar call now, shouldn't we? <laughs> just uh, no, don't, do don't ever do that again. <laughs> and I've also I've sung and I've done my Gangnam style dance today. So it's, that's true. That's true. There, there is a reason why we have thousands and thousands of viewers on this show. Oh yes, <laughs> yes. Okay, my last thought piece for the day. This is interesting, and I posted this on my blog. This is something that Mark Hall posted. He got from I think a, a, one of Andy Stanley's uh, uh, leadership podcasts. Uh, and the reaction has been cynical, I would say, on my blog, uh, in the comment no. section. Uh, Andy says, um, and, and I love, I love Andy. I, I think I think Andy is one of the most brilliant communicators that we have, mm -hmm. uh, not only in the church, but I think just, just in or outside of the church. He said, let's say that something happens to me. He's trying to answer the criticism of the multi-site thing that John MacArthur was talking about in the mega church, huge thing. He said, let's say something happens to me and all the all of my staff and all of the buildings at North Point and all of the campuses explode. They're just obliviated. Uh, let's make a worst case scenario. There's no staff, there's no buildings, there's no me. And he but said there is there is an uproar on watchdog vloggers talking about how they knew it all along. And they were yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry. Well, anyway, yeah, bad joke there, Matt. Anyway, Andy said, here's Here's what would happen. He said, on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday, the following week, thousands and thousands of adults would gather in homes all over the city and pray together and do Bible study and take care of whatever family members are left over. And the church is going to go on because at the end of the day, circles are better than rows. And from day one, we've been committed to creating a culture that's all about circles and not rows. We're famous for our rows, but our strength of our churches is what happens in circles. So what he says is, if I'm not here, if... Even if all, all the staff isn't here, all the paid staff is gone, even if all the buildings are blown to smithereens, those people that are still here that survived whatever tragedy that caused this to happen to happen uh, would still meet, they'd still be, the strength of the church is really in the circles or in those small groups where people care and minister and disciple each other. I, I thought it was great stuff. I mean, I, I, I thought, now the cynical, some that are a little bit more cynical are like, that had never happened. It never happened. Monday of that of that week, everybody'd be gone because Andy's gone, the staff's gone, the buildings are gone. And I just 
would would it continue if if North Point is twenty thousand people? Would it continue twenty thousand strong? No, obviously it would change. But would the core of the church um, continue? Uh, I think I think a lot of it would in any situation. I think a lot of it would in in uh, quite frankly, a, not all, but a, a large degree of of some of these larger churches that are built, as Andy says, on circles. Um, and the people that are cynical, again, I kind of go back to the last thing. Yeah. Are they the ones that just know that if, if they were obliterated and their churches were obliterated, that absolutely no one would actually actually notice? I don't know. That, that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying, thankfully, this hasn't happened to any church, and we don't know. Right. Uh, but what, even if this wouldn't happen at North Point, what a wonderful goal to try and have and what a wonderful plan to try and have to plan that if everything gets wiped out, that the church of Jesus goes on. It's, yeah. it's, it's at least an admirable plan, and I hope we never see whether or not it works. Yeah. I'm reminded of, um, of the Carl George story about the guy going to the hospital and how all of a sudden you know, people from the church started showing up and, and making sure that they were cared for and meals mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff and nobody was paid and then pastor finally shows up and they get asked, well, how many pastors are there at your church? You know, because everybody keeps showing up. You know, and I think there's there's something mm -hmm. to that. There's something to building that that DNA and that culture into a church. And I I, I agree with you. I, I think we really like to snipe at the bigger guys. And, and say that they're all fluff or all this or all that. And, you know, they built a culture that will, I think, will, will probably survive. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the other thing I think that a lot of people think um, about these larger guys, uh, the guys with the larger churches, is that, that it's all built on personality and that they have no clue what's going to happen when they leave. And, and I know internally at a lot of these places, it's... Uh, it's a concern, you know, uh, but there's a plan in place, and uh, it's not that these guys are, uh, you know, flying blind without a plan. To be honest, you don't you don't get a church that large without strategic planning. Right. Um, so for outsiders to think, you know, well, when Andy dies or Andy gets hit by a bus, this whole thing goes away. No, there's there's uh, there's a lot more thought and planning that have gone into that, and uh, yeah. You know, Andy's, Andy's no spring chicken these days either. So yeah. uh, a lot of these guys are, are constantly, you know, they're, they're, they, uh, they very much want the church that they helped found to continue to thrive for the next generation. And they know that once they hit their 50s and their 60s, that that's, a, that's just a difficult thing to, mm -hmm. uh, they don't want their church to be a museum any more than, uh, than anybody else does. But anyway, I'm off my high horse. And by by the way, since since we're talking about Andy, and Andy, I do know you're watching. Yes. Hey, Andy. Um, what up? Hey, how you doing? Um, his book is the deep and wide. I'm I'm a fan, man. I I am a fan, and he talks in there about how even now he's he realizes you know some of the some of the stuff that you know it's, he doesn't speak specifically to the idea of what happens when he goes away but he does talk about building a culture where he understands that you know he's going to really love everything that they're doing even when the culture doesn't and mm -hmm. bringing in people to push him on that kind of thing and say look you know this this worked 5 years ago but it doesn't work anymore and we need to change it and you know so He's got that that kind of foresight and that kind of the kind of thinking and bake that into the culture of, of North Point to to the point where you know are they going to continue on at, at you know twenty thousand or however many people after he leaves maybe maybe not but I still think they're going to do pretty pretty cool things and, and really be able to continue yeah. you know a great deal of what they're currently doing so yeah. Yep, yep, I think so. That's that's on my reading list. I I just got the full collection uh, of John MacArthur and oh. John Maxwell books that I'm trying to wade through. So as soon as I get through all that, I'm going to read Andy's new one. Outstanding, <laughs> outstanding. So is that is that John MacArthur's guide to going multi-site? Yeah, it's a very short book. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Did I ever tell you my John MacArthur story? No. <laughs> oh, I, I have the auto recording somewhere. I'll have to I'll have to get that out and repost it. I think it's hilarious. Who was it? I don't even remember. This was this was probably three or four years ago. Um, John MacArthur was doing a radio interview with with one of these kind of watchdoggy guys. I don't remember who it was, and I don't even remember wh how my name got brought up. <laughs> <laughs> but he, the interviewer, asked the guy. He read something on my blog. That some other person had said something about John MacArthur, but rather than attributing it to this other person, he attributed it to me. <laughs> and he said, "Now, so what do you think about Todd Rhodes here, who says that?" Uh, and I don't even remember what it was. Oh, uh, what do you think about this? And uh, John MacArthur started answering the question. He got about two sentences, and he said, "Who's this? Who's this Todd Rhodes guy?" <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Todd who? He's no. He said Todd who? He said, "Who's this Todd? Todd who?" Said this. <laughs> so that was my claim to fame. That's as close as I've ever gotten, gotten other than row 25 in College Chapel of being <laughs> MacArthur. But uh, I'm affectionately known as, as Todd Who. Todd Who, yes. So, so, he's been watching I, ever since. I don't think so. No. no. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's one that's not no. watching. The shame. I don't think he's a Todd and Matt fanboy. Uh, it's something to strive for. <laughs> yeah, really. I think I think we've we've offended more people than we've than we've gained. Outstanding. <laughs> you know, I, I really enjoy this. Uh, there's never, and Matt and I have joked kind of off camera. That there's there's uh, there's so much stuff that we just don't include. I, I think we probably went long today, but it's been fun. But uh, um, you know, there's. Ten or fifteen other stories that we could have easily included. The church, I love the church, but the church is so quirky and so fun, and uh, and so many great things that are happening in the church, and so many things that just turn your stomach that happen in the church. But um, um, I, I love, I love to uh, to read about it, report about it, and talk about it. It's been fun to to kind of share. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I do have to say, you know, I, I know that we we may. We may have poked fun at the Baptists in the past once, once or twice. It's probably mostly Todd, um, of which I am one. I still consider me, myself one. Deep me, down, me, me too, me too. But I, I do have to, I do have to throw some props out. You know, we, we have. I think I told you last week that we had a group coming up from um, the Mid Maryland Baptist Association to do some um, yeah. disaster recovery work. We got like thirty guys up here that you know sleeping on church floors and. You know, drinking bad coffee to go out and, and start gutting homes down on the south shore of Long Island. So, mm -hmm. I, I do have to give the Maryland Baptist Association some some props there because you know we we also we, we we might poke a little fun every now and then. So, <laughs> you you only you only poke fun at those that you love. Exactly. <laughs> Usually. Usually. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah. So, uh, okay. anything else going on? Yeah, you know, just kind of running around, making sure these guys are in good shape, and, um, you know, doing odds and ends. That's, that, that, that sounds like I'm in the mafia, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Are you? A little of that. Well, you know, we don't <laughs> talk about that, you know. There's no such thing. Yeah, my family thinks I were, uh, I'm like a secret agent because nobody knows what I do, so... <laughs> <laughs> and I don't give them the URL to this show because they would they would just <laughs> I'm more confused now than what I was. <laughs> it's a wise man right there. So what, what do you got going on? You had the you had the, the nines replay last week. Yeah, the nines replay this week and had a lot of people come and watch uh watching into that. Um I'm actually gonna take a few days off next week and and uh with absolutely nothing planned. We'll still do the show. Cool. If you're around, but uh, um, I'm just gonna kind of kick back. You know, I didn't. I never was able to really take a, a week off after the night, so I'm ready just to just kind of veg for a week. So it's gonna be nice. Nice. Very cool. So honeydew list or not even that? Um, I've not 
I've not suggested a honeydew list, and and uh, I'm sure there will be one, but nothing significant. I, the the uh, the benefit of being totally inept at any kind of home improvement really keeps the honeydew list at a minimum, which is the way I like it. I, <laughs> well, well done, well done. <laughs> so, well, all right, all right. We thank uh, everybody for watching, and uh, yeah, until next week. So, when we when we do it all again, and see what Pat Robertson has to say about the uh, the creation movement. Yes, that'll be that'll be thrilling. Yes, that's that's a teaser. We're, we're getting yes. we're, we're getting high level. So. We're, we're getting there. When we officially launch the show early next year, it's going to be good. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. It's good. Yes, it's going to be good. Yeah. yeah, well, we did get good news, though, this week. We have been picked up for a second season, so we will yes. be back the first of the year. Yes. So we just found we found that out uh, we found that out from the powers that be this just this week, yesterday, actually. So Out, outstanding. I, I couldn't be more. Now, more, uh, now, did they come through with the, uh, with the upping of the salary? No. No, and that partially, I think I think we were we were set for the salary increase until until we lost the Lifeway sponsorship. Oh, dang it! <laughs> so they're gonna hold off the increases until we can find another sponsor. We have to get we have to get Lifeway back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, maybe next week week we, we can make Lifeway week and, and beg and plead. Oh, okay. All our friends. <laughs> we can just we can just start doing a telethon, man. That could be fun. We could. No, you're not feeling that, are you? No, I'm actually thinking that's a good idea. <laughs> I don't know who the one viewer is that's been watching this the whole time, but I hope they're rich. Because only <laughs> you can make it. <laughs> maybe if we came, maybe if we came up with a with a day, like it could be Filter Friday. Filter Friday. But. <laughs> They already got like a Wednesday or a Friday day. We need something like a Wednesday. I think that's the only day left, isn't it? Yeah. All right. Well, let's think about that. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to come up with that. We'll patent it. So. Yes. Okay. Enough of this witty banter. Yes. <laughs> until until next week. Have a great week, Todd. <laughs> see you, you too, Matt. We'll see you. Bye.